Hi and welcome to my dissertation defense. My dissertation is about uh, named data networking in local area networks. Named data networking is a new data centric network architecture that changes the network's service semantics from packet delivery to content retrieval. Today's internet uses the IP protocol. IP provides a service to deliver a packet to a given destination address. This picture shows the packet format of IP. We can see that each packet has a source address and a destination address. Our new architecture, NDN, provides a service to retrieve a content of a given name. As we can see, the, the NDN packet carries a content name, but there is no address in the packet. NDN uses two types of packets, interest and data. The interest packet is a question to the network. It asks the network to retrieve a piece of content, while the data packet is, uh, is the answer from the network. It carries the, the content payload. Interest and data should have the same content name. So what's the difference between IP and NDN? Suppose you want to read my dissertation in this department network. In IP architecture, you have to find the address of my desktop. Then you can send the packets to my desktop in order to retrieve the file. In case my desktop is turned off, you won't be able to get the file. In NDN architecture, you will express interest with the name of my dissertation. It will, it will start with a routable prefix then it has the file name and it also has a version number of and the segment number. Then any node who has this data can reply and anyone can cache the data. And this means if you have my dissertation already, you will, you can also reply to this interest. And this makes the network more robust and efficient. My dissertation proposed a complete solution for applying NDN in local area networks. We start with NFD, the NDN forwarding daemon, which is a software implementation of the NDN architecture. When we connect two NFDs together over a Ethernet, over Ethernet, one problem we have to solve is Ethernet has limited MTU size, which limits each package to be no, uh, no more than 1500 bytes. But some NDN packets can be larger than that. In order to send those NDN packets over Ethernet, we need NDN link protocol. The NDN link protocol provides a fragmentation and reassembly service so that we can send large packets over Ethernet. Then think about the simplest local area network, which is a single broadcast medium. On a broadcast medium, everyone can hear everyone each other. Everyone can f hear from each other. Then if I ask for a certain piece of data and someone send it to me, uh, then everyone else is going to hear this communication, even if they don't want this data. And then, since NFD is in software, then this means everyone else need to also process those packets in software, and this causes significant CPU overhead. To reduce this overhead, we design NDNIC, a network interface card that can filter out those packets so they don't get into software, they are dropped in hardware. Then, looking beyond a single hop and think about switch Ethernet environment. One research question in this area is how do you find the content in the switch Ethernet uh, without using a routing protocol? Because routing protocol has too much overhead. 
and and may need manual configuration. So we propose ending self learning, which is a strategy to find the content with no routing, and it uses occasionally flooding. And finally, many network topology contain circles. If we flood some packets, the packet may loop around the circles. To prevent that, we define ending forwarding behavior. Uh, it covers multiple topics, but one of them is how to prevent packet loops. And that's that are those are the major pieces of my dissertation. But in this presentation, I will focus on NDNIC, uh, how do you filter packets in hardware, and also NDN self-learning, how do you find the content in a switch Ethernet environment. Uh, let's go into the first part, NDNIC. NDNIC operates in a, in a single broadcast medium on an end host. Uh, uh, the property of a broadcast medium is each device can hear all the signals transmitted within the range. In the current in current system, the network interface card will filter the packet. So let me give an example. In this wireless network, the access point sends the packets, and the destination of this packet is B. But since it the wireless network is a broadcast medium, so both A and B will receive this packet. Then in their network interface card, they will look whether the destination address of the packet is equals the host's own address. So, so for A, A will see that the destination is not A, so it will drop the packet in hardware. Uh, while B will see, oh, the destination is B, so B will deliver this packet for software processing. And having this filter in hardware allows us to save the CPU circles and the power consumption of the main system. But this filtering is only based on address. And when we operate NDN over broadcast medium, since NDN packets do not have address, Every NDN packet would have to be processed in NFD in the main CPU, and this causes significant CPU overhead. So, our question is, can we design a network interface card that can filter NDN packets based on their names? So, we designed a, a NDNIC. The goal for NDNIC is to do packet filtering based on names. Uh, but one problem is, there are a hundred thousand names in a typical NDN node, and uh, and uh, usually a network interface card only has tens of kilobytes of memory. How do we fit so many names into this small amount of memory? This is a major challenge in NDNIC design. Our idea is we put the names into Bloom filters. A uh, Bloom filter is a p compact data structure. We can put a lot of search keys into a small amount of memory. Then the NIC can just uh, um, search the Bloom filters to see if there is a match and admit a, a packet if it they match the Bloom filters. A property of Bloom filter is there is no false negative. This is good because it means NDNIC won't miss any packets that should be accepted. On the other hand, since Bloom filter is compact, it may have false positives. And, and that means some packet can be admitted because they match the Bloom filter due to false positive. Eventually, they will be dropped by NFD software, but it will cause some CPU overhead. So for NDNIC, we should try to reduce the false positives. Uh, but before I go in, uh, go, go into how the details, I will present the NDNIC architecture. Uh, this picture shows what we already have before NDNIC. On the bottom is the hardware. The regular NIC has the Mac and the physical, and, and also the physical layer. Then the software side, we have the NDN forwarding daemon. NDN forwarding daemon itself has a few name-based tables which uh, for forwarding decisions and also for packet filtering, and it serves the NDN applications on the top. In NDNIC, we added the Bloom filters. 
We also add a packet filtering logic, which will take every incoming NDN packet and look up and look at the Bloom filter to decide whether to admit or drop it. Then on the software side, we will need a NDNIC driver. It has an update algorithm uh, that downloads the names from NFD's name tables into the Bloom filter. Uh, one problem here is names can be removed from the NFD's name tables, but regular Bloom filter cannot support name removal. To, solve, uh, to support name removal, we will need counting Bloom filters. But since counting Bloom filters consume more memory than a regular Bloom filter, we keep the counting Bloom filter in the NDUnique driver while we have regular Bloom filter in the, in the hardware and we keep them in synchronize with each other. Uh, we download the bits from counting Bloom filter to the regular Bloom filter so as to save the fast memory in the NDNIC hardware will achieve the same result. So what names should we put in the Bloom filter? But to answer that question, we first need to know what packets should be admitted by an NDN host. An end host should admit interests that can be satisfied by the local node, and this means either the local cache contains matching data, or there is a local application can produce the data requested in the interest. The end host should also admit data that have been requested by the local node, and this means the local interest has sent interest. A local application has sent interest. So in those three kinds are represented in three name-based tables in NFD. They are called the content store, which is a cache, the forwarding information base, which keeps the prefix of each prefix that can be served by local applications, and the pending interest table, which is how many the interest that has been sent by local applications. Naively, we can just put all the names from those three tables into the Bloom filter, but it's more complicated than that, because Bloom filters can only support exact match queries, while NDN will need prefix match queries. In order to support prefix match uh, in Bloom filters, uh, we, need to, uh, we need some algorithms. For example, the fib. Fib entry prefix is the prefix of the interest name. To support this prefix match, we just need to put the Fib entry name into the Bloom filter. Uh, for example, Fib entry AB, we will have AB in the Bloom filter. Then, when the interest comes in, we will query with all the prefix of the interest name. Uh, for interest ABX, we will query ABX, AB, A, and the slash. So if we, as we see, AB is a match, so we should admit this interest. The pending interest table has the same prefix match algorithm as FIB, uh, but the difference is a pending interest will be set by, by data, so it admits data instead of interest, and therefore we will need a separate Bloom filter, although it runs the same procedure as FIB. Uh, the, then both the fib and the pit, as we notice, is the entry name is the prefix of the packet name, so entry name is shorter than the packet name. On the other hand, the content store is different. It's also prefix match, but now the packet name is, sh is now it's the packet name is it. the entry name is longer than the packet name because incoming interest name is the prefix of the cached data name. To so support this reverse kind of prefix match, we will have to put all the data names and all their prefix into the Bloom filter. So for data A, B, X, we will need four names in the Bloom filter. The slash, A, A, B, and A, B, X. But when the interest comes in, it's easy. We, it's interest comes in, it's exact match on the Bloom filter. We only need to query with just the interest name. But uh, a problem here is Bloom filter has false positives. And the more names we put in a Bloom filter, the higher is the false positive rate. For example, if we have a Bloom filter of 8 kilobytes, 
if we put in 10,000 names, the false positive rate is 4.3%. It's okay. But if we put in 50,000 names, the false positive rate go up to 54%, more than half. And the content store is the largest table among the three because uh, and the host can catch a lot of data, but it won't have lots of fee entries because it won't have lots of running uh, local applications. It also won't have a lot of pending interest. So we sh and and to make things worse, as we see here, the CS names and their prefix go into BFCS. So the primary optimization target is BFCS. We propose two novel applications to reduce the false positives in BFCS. The first one is called Basic CS. Uh, this picture shows a name hierarchy. We have ABX and ABY in the content store. So those red circles indicate what names should be put in BFCS. However, uh, in this name hierarchy, we have a FIB entry at AB. And correspondingly, there will be a BFFib prefix at AB. And this means every interest starting with AB will be admitted. And as we see, AB, ABX, ABY, they are already admitted by the BFFib prefix. So we don't have to insert them into BFCS again. And this slightly reduces the BFCS false positive. Our second optimization is called Active CS. It's the same name hierarchy, but this time there is no fib prefix at AB. However, in order to re remove multiple names from BFCS, we can still create a fib BF fib prefix at AB to match every interest start with AB, so that we can remove some names from BFCS. Uh, however, if we do that, we are introducing a new kind of false positive called the prefix match false positive. Because if an interest ABZ comes in, it will match the BF fib prefix and be admitted. But there is no actual fib prefix at AB, so it doesn't match the fib, and it also doesn't match the CS, so that interest would be a false positive. The goal of active CS is to minimize the overall false positive. We have some heuristics, but due to time constraint, I will not go into that detail. We evaluated NDUNIC using NFS traffic. We collected NFS file access traces in an office network. Uh, the trace has two servers and 57 clients, so 59 total end hosts. Then we use that NFS trace to emulate NDN-based file access and recorded the packet timing and NFDs table changes. And finally, we use those information to run simulation on NDUNIC for each end host individually. Then we compare the performance among the three CS optimization algorithms and also different parameters. This plot shows how many packets are admitted by regular NIC and NDU NIC with different Bloom filter sizes. The y x-axis is Bloom filter size, while y-axis is the packets ad admitted by all the end hosts added together. The orange part is the packet that is eventually the packet that is eventually accepted by NFD, while the gray part are unwanted packets that are dropped by NFD, which means overhead. Uh, we can see that regular NIC will admit all the incoming packets, but 98.5% are dropped by NFD software. Well, NDUNIC with modest Bloom filter size can filter out 92% of unwanted packets, uh, which is of course much better than regular NIC. And if we have larger Bloom filter, the, f the filter accuracy is even better. And all those uh, op results are from a uh, no CS optimization. But when we add a CS optimization, 
this one shows diff. Uh, this one shows uh, how many pack uh, the diff the comparison between CS optimization algorithms, and the y-axis is uh, y-axis is the percentage of regular NIC. The blue bus is how many packets are admitted compared to regular NIC, while yellow bus is estimation of CPU circles. Uh, we can see that uh, compared to no optimization, basic CS can only give limited improvement because it only works if the FIB entry covers C CS cached names, and which doesn't often occur. While active CS can help more and uh, make the performance uh, uh, quite close to the optimal. And that concludes the first half of my talk about NDUNIC. Now we move uh, now we move beyond a single a single broadcast medium, and think about a switch Ethernet environment. In this environment, the problem we want to solve is how do you find the content without a routing protocol. So we propose ending self-learning. It works like this. Uh, when an interest comes in, and the switch doesn't know where the data can be found, it will flood the interest. Then, when the when if the flooding reaches a producer or a cache, that, then that producer will re reply with the data. Then by observing where the data comes from, the switch can create a FIB entry pointing to the origin of the data so that a future interest can be unicast and doesn't need a flooding anymore. You may notice that this procedure is very similar to the flood and lump pr uh, procedure in switch Ethernet. Yes, it is. But NDN is a name-based architecture. There is no address in the NDN packets. So the FIB entry needed to be associated with a, a name prefix, and the question is, what name prefix do we put in the FIB entry? And we call it the granularity problem. The naive solution to granularity problem is one shorter prefix, which is we just use the data name but minus the last component. So for data name ABC1, we will use ABC as the FIB prefix. But suppose the producer actually serves all the interests starting with A B and this FIB prefix is this FIB prefix is actually longer than the producer's prefix and it's going to cause unnecessary flooding. If we send the interest A B D one, it will not match the FIB entry prefix at the switch, so it will be flooded unnecessarily. Our solution is to let the producer explicitly inform the network what prefix it can serve. So when the producer sends back the data, it will attach a prefix announcement onto the data packet saying, oh, my prefix is AB. Then when this data is sent to the switch, the switch can learn the FIB prefix accurately. And, th and therefore, there would be no unnecessary flooding. Compared to switch Ethernet, uh, we also have a few other benefits. One of them is we no longer need the spanning tree protocol. In switch Ethernet, uh, packet flooding can cause bridge loops because Ethernet switch does not have states. It will always flood a packet if the destination is unknown. And then their solution to stop those loops is the spanning tree protocol. It uses some control message, uh, and the result of spanning tree protocol is some links get disabled, and the topology is reduced to a spanning tree, so that bridge loops cannot occur. So there is no more circles. But the drawback of spanning tree protocol is, say, between A and B, it was three hops, but since I disabled a link, Spanning tree protocol disabled the link, now it becomes four hops. It's so some some packet forwarding goes on a longer than short uh, on a path that is not the shortest path. Also it also since some links are disabled, it also reduces the overall available bandwidth in the network. But NDN doesn't need a spanning tree protocol because each NDN node can remember what interests have been forwarded or flooded in their pending interest table. 
So when an interest comes in a second time, the duplicate interest won't be forwarded or flooded again, so that a loop cannot occur. And with that, NDN can use utilize all the links and and be able to forward the packets on the shortest paths or the, uh, in most cases. Another benefit is we can recover from link failure faster. When we detect a link failure, a node can either use alternate paths or, re or tell the downstream to take this corrective action. So in this, in this topology, suppose we already did the initial flooding, so we know all the passes. Then when the interest comes to B, but the link, the link between B and D has failed, B can try to use alternate paths, but since B doesn't have one, so B return a NAC packet. A NAC, also called a ne negative acknowledgement, is a control message that tells that uh, one of its purpose is to tell the downstream there is a link failure. So B will tell A, oh, my link failed. And uh, after hearing this control message, A, is, A can send the interest up to out to the alternate path to in order to reach the producer on the right. And all this happens at the packet time scale. It doesn't need to wait for spanning tree protocol or the, the IP routing protocol to converge. So this is much faster recovery. We evaluated ending self-learning using the same NFS trace as I mentioned before. Uh, the x-axis of this plot is the different uh, forwarding schemes, uh, while y-axis is how many packets are transmitted in order to complete the communication. Broadcast means broadcasting all the interest, uh, but data only comes back on one pass, and uh, of course it will use the highest amount of bandwidth. Then ONR is the early work uh, t using the self-learning idea, but their granularity is one shot prefix, and as I've said, one shot this granularity can cause unnecessary flooding, and it's especially severe in N NFS traffic. So their bandwidth use is only a little bit less than broadcast. For Ethernet, Ethernet itself doesn't have the concept of granularity. Uh, we implemented Ethernet using the same prefix announcement as ours, so it's a performance, but it still uses more, uh, more bandwidth than us because there is overhead from the Spanish protocol. The last one ending self-learning is our scheme. It uses the least amount of bandwidth to complete the communication. Another interesting problem in self-learning is how do you retrieve contents from the internet. Uh, in our design, we let the internet gateway announce itself as a producer of the slash prefix, so this announcement can match any interest that should go to the internet, and it also allows it also allows the nodes in the local area network to use the regular flooding procedure to find a path to the gateway. So in this topology, suppose everyone has already learned the path to the gateway. So A can send the interest out to the internet and retrieve the data back. And as I mentioned earlier, every NDN node can have a cache. So when the data comes back, a, R, and G will put the data into their cache. And then if another consumer like B wants the same data, the in-network caching can save some bandwidth because now R can reply to this interest and give give B this the data and the interest doesn't go onto the internet. But one limitation is this, uh, this can we can only utilize unpass caches or the cache between the consumer and the gateway. Uh, since every cache has limited capacity, suppose I and G no longer has the data. Then when B asks for this data, the interest will be forwarded out to the internet following the FIB entrance. But the internet connection could be slow, so uh, are we able to use the off-pass cache at A to save some some bandwidth at the internet connection. So we did an interest diversion scheme. Uh, in this scheme, t 
to achieve interest diversion, first, when the data is initially retrieved for A, both I and G should remember where the data went in their CS entrance. Then, when their content store is full, they try to only evict the data payload, but keep the, keep the information about where the data went, and also the data names for a bit longer. And then, and we, this information is called a stub. And then, when B express interest asking for the same data, it will match a stub entry at R. And R can forward the interest to the off-pass cache at A. And since the interest is diverted off the pass uh, towards the gateway, so it's called, it's called a diversion. And then if, if the A still has the data, A can reply with the data to satisfy B and the interest doesn't go onto the internet. But there is a trade-off here. It is also possible that A also no longer has the data. And if that happens, A will have to send a neck back to R, tell R that I don't have the data, then R can send the interest out to the internet. And this causes uh, a bit of process CPU overhead as well as some add some delay onto this retrieval. So we have some heuristics to reduce this situation. We evaluated the interest diversion scheme using this three tier tree topology. Uh, the traffic is a mix between interest con internet content retrieval and also local data retrieval among the end host, and the both traffic pattern will compete for the limited cache space on every node. Uh, this plot shows uh, the savings due to in it due to interest uh, interest diversion. Uh, the y-axis is how many packets are sent to or from the internet. The, uh, the orange bus shows the number of packets without interest diversion and the green bus are with interest diversion. We can see that if most of the traffic are internet traffic, interest diversion can save 13.2% of bandwidth. But if most of the traffic are, are local traffic, then the bandwidth saving will be smaller. Okay, that concludes the self-learning portion, and that's end of my talk. Thank you, everyone, and 